You know, the world's a pretty big place when you think about it. But do you ever stop to consider why you live where you do in this world? I mean, why this state, or that city, or this neighborhood, or your street for that matter? Most of us tend to think about where we live in terms of places that meet our needs. You know, good school systems, good community services, lower taxes, affordability, that sort of thing. But have you ever stopped to consider that perhaps God placed you where you live for a different reason altogether? Perhaps we live where we live not to have our needs met, but to meet the needs of the people around us. Jeremiah 29, 7 reads, Work for the peace and prosperity of the city where I sent you. Seek the Lord for it, for its welfare will determine your welfare. Every Christ follower should be a gift to his or her neighborhood, and every church should be a gift to its city. God has placed us and our church in this part of his world for a purpose, to make an impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our neighborhood as a church, and it's home to more than 600,000 names and faces, and over 50% of them report they have no connection to a church at all. That is every other person you meet. They are the reason we are here. Since the opening of our Kesslinger and Mill Creek campuses, our ability to love and serve our neighbors has grown immensely. Our Shepherd's Heart Care Center started out as just a closet of extra food, and now serves well over 1,000 people every month. Our Masterpiece Ministries reach and serve dozens of families of children with special needs in our community. We are increasingly becoming a church not for ourselves, but for our neighbors. And as we've grown, God has made it increasingly clear to us that our greatest impact is not going to happen by building bigger and bigger facilities at any one campus. We believe we must reproduce ourselves by strategically placing campuses in the communities we're already poised to reach. We are convinced that God is leading us toward becoming a family of neighborhood churches committed to transforming lives and impacting the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This neighborhood church vision is to strategically expand and multiply our gospel impact through establishing neighborhood churches. It means we must also intentionally develop new leaders in all areas of ministry. We've already begun this through our Leadership Institute and expanding it through our pastoral residency program. It means developing new opportunities keeping our eyes open for communities in need and cultivating hearts of compassion that can see the opportunities emerging for gospel impact. Ministries like our Shepherd's Heart Care Center, Masterpiece Ministry, Support and Care Ministries have been reaching the unique needs of our neighbors that we are only just beginning. More importantly, it means more people transformed by the gospel, experiencing grace, growing in faith, and making an impact right where they are. It means people like you. You see, we cannot do this without you. You are the gospel agent in your home. You are the chapel on your street and in your neighborhood. There are 300,000 people right around us who do not know the hope of the gospel. What could God do if everyone watching is committed to loving and serving their neighbors? This is what the Neighborhood Church vision is all about. It's about the gospel, the church, the neighborhood, and you. Every time I am reminded of that vision um, that we believe God has given us as a church, I am, um, on the one hand, I'm just incredibly encouraged. I, I, even just being here this morning and looking out across the room and seeing people that God has brought in here. Over the last couple of weeks, we've uh, had some of the other pastors of Chapel Street have been here to preach. And so I've been able to be more available and present in the lobby. And I was just um, amazed at how many people I've met that I had no idea were a part of this community, new people that have gotten folded in. And it's been this, we were the first sort of iteration of this, this vision and God has been so faithful in the process, but I'm also just sort of overwhelmed with gratitude. The, the people that we've been able to just share in this with so many of you who have, um, whether you were here from the beginning, have joined somewhere along the way, but who have just come in to say, okay, we want to be a part of this. And we want to live this out, and God continues to, um, to provide opportunities, and we continue as leadership to try to understand where God is working and moving and how do we align with that and faithful obedience to him. And so um, we're thankful, and, and we covet your prayers um, and your conversations as, as a part of this process. 
Uh, my wife and I, um, over the years, we, we have had the opportunity to, particularly when we were in student ministry for so many years, to um, come alongside of young couples before they got married and do uh, what, what they call premarital counseling. Like a lot of times maybe one of our kids uh, that we had in D groups or in the student ministries would grow up and go to college and fall in love and come back. And before they get married, they would ask us if we would take them through kind of a, a series of conversations to help them prepare for marriage. And they're only like halfway listening to you at this point in time. They're pretty sure they've got it all figured out. And, but one of, the, one of the things that we always try to tee up with couples as a part of this process and, um, is this conversation around experience versus expectations. Or expectations usually come beforehand and, and how that gets lived out in, in reality. Because every, everyone who's entered into a relationship, and particularly marriage, does so with a series of assumptions, expectations about what that's going to look like. Um, whether that is, is just from the origins that we've had growing up, what we saw, how it was lived out. Uh, culturally, there's people, if you come from different parts of the United States, even, even just around us, from urban to rural to suburban, there's, there's culturally sort of assumptions that are made. If, if you have, it could be just as, as much your personality, even preferences, say, shape all of these expectations that we have coming in to marriage. And so part of our goal in those conversations were to help them think about what those expectations are and their response when expectations aren't met when the experience doesn't align, align exactly with their assumptions about how things are going to go. Because when, when expectations aren't realized, oftentimes that leads to frustration. Um, whether those expectations are spoken or not, and frustration, when that goes unresolved, will lead to conflict. Conflict, if, if that isn't navigated well, will ultimately result in, in doubt. And, and so you can find a couple early on in, in their relationship beginning to question if their understanding of the love that they had, that they felt like drew them together, if that was, was real or if that was, if they overestimated that, they can begin to question if they've got something wrong and they can begin to start asking themselves if the only way to go forward is, is to take separate paths. And the reality is, is that we, we all experience this. Married, single, uh, students, uh, adults, kids, we all carry in expectations into relationships, whether or not we realize it or not. In fact, I would argue that we do this very same thing when we think about and talk about a relationship with God. And so what happens when our expectation, right, spoken or unspoken, doesn't align with our experience? What happened when that continues and ultimately results in doubt? Doubt about who God is, about what he is like, doubt about how he thinks and feels and views us. And the psalm that we're going to look at today is it deals with an experience of what I'm going to call honest doubt. Doubt that, that results when the psalmist's expectation of God and how God operates and works and moves doesn't match his experience in life. So this is why we've titled this psalm today, A Song of Struggle. A Song of Struggle. So we're going to turn to Psalm 73. If you brought a Bible with you this morning, I encourage you to flip over there, but it'll also be on the screen as well. And as we make our way over to Psalm 73, I want to just real quickly address this issue of doubt and specifically the doubt experienced in the context of the church. And there's two things I want to mention here. First is that I think everyone deals with doubt at one point in time in their faith journey. Um, and by one point in time, I mean probably multiple times, right? It, 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 there's no one that I know that I've had enough, done enough life with that has experienced at one level or another for one reason or another an honest sort of wrestling with their understanding of who God is, how they relate to him, and, and doubt as we would we talk about it. 
One, uh, one example of this that I, I read about and that I saw was um, Mother Teresa. Maybe some of you will remember this, is that following her death, a series of letters that she had written to close friends and to spiritual mentors in her life revealed very dark, honest struggle in, in how God was working. Again, she was serving the poorest of the poor in Calcutta. She saw horrible things. And so she had very sincere, honest questions about where God was at in, in the midst of this, and she communicated those. Time Magazine did an article on this entitled The Secret Life of Mother Teresa. And you can't read the subtitle there, but it, it says, newly published letters reveal a beloved icon's 50-year crisis of faith. And it was interesting to watch people's reaction to this. Because on one hand, some people use it as an opportunity to, to um, view or to combat kind of the, the faith that Mother Teresa had taught and that she had modeled and, and that she had um, handed down to those who served with her and were served by her. Many of us, and this was my reaction when I saw this, is that it, it made her more real. It, it made her more approachable. It made, there was like, how could you not deal with those questions in the face of the things that she experienced? There was a sincerity to the faith that she had. And I think also I was just um, inspired by the faithfulness and obedience, even in the midst of the questions. I remember being uh, the taking away of that. But then secondly, I would, I would also encourage you that I don't think doubt is toxic to faith. And what I mean by that is, again, if this is something we all experience in a part of our faith journey with Jesus, is that it's not, it's not doubt that's toxic to our faith, it's, it's, it's dishonest doubt. It's, it's doubt that we don't surface, it's doubt that we're afraid to ask tough questions. Again, in student ministries, high school and middle school kids, part of the journey of you going from you, you having a faith that's been handed to you by your parents and your teachers and your D group leaders and all that, to having your faith is going to be processing difficult questions. And that sometimes is messy, but doubt is not toxic to your faith, right? Silence in the midst of doubt, that can be toxic. So we, ha we have to bring this up. We have to deal with this. We have to ask tough questions. And one of the things that Asaph's Psalm here in Psalm 73 is, is, it, is it gives us permission to do that. So let's look at Psalm 73 together, beginning in verse one. Asaph writes this, he says, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped and I nearly lost my foothold. So let me pause right here. So Asaph is, is, is telling his story. Um, like when I was a kid growing up, I, I grew up in a pretty relatively small rural church in Eaton, Ohio. It's a, a farm town and we would have Sunday evening church and they would do testimony night. And they would like, people would walk up front or they'd hand around the mic and people would share stories. And most of the time it was really good, but you, you hand a live mic to people, it can go sideways uh, quick. And so it was always kind of entertaining a little bit too, but. The, the, in Hebrew worship, there was something similar to this, and you, you kind of read Psalm 73 as if Asaph is, is telling you his story. And at the outset of his story, he says, here is my conviction, here is the conclusion. He gives, you, he gives away the ending. He says, God is good to Israel. This is where he's landed. But verse two tells you that in the process of getting there, I almost fell off the path, right? He uses this, this common metaphor in wisdom literature of the path representing life and the journey and following after God. And he says, I, I almost tripped in my process of getting to this conclusion that God is good. So let's begin by looking at this idea of expectation versus experience. And let's look at it in the context of, of Asaph's story here. So we're gonna pick it up because he's gonna show us why he almost slipped here. He writes this, he says, for I envied the arrogant, and when I saw the prosperity of the wicked, they have no struggles, and their bodies are healthy and strong. They are free from common human burdens, and they're not plagued by human ills. Therefore, pride is their necklace, and they clothe themselves with violence. 
From their callous hearts comes iniquity. Their evil imaginations have no limits. Let me, let me pause right there for one second because the NIV and their translation of, of this psalm chose in verse seven um, a, a, the, the Syriac and the Septuagint's phrasing of verse seven. In the oldest manuscripts of the Hebrew, they, they says the way he describes this abundance is that their eyes bulge with fat, which I think that's better, really. It gets, that's pretty descriptive when you think about what he's saying here. He goes on in verse 8, he says, they scoff, they speak with malice, with arrogance, they threaten oppression. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Therefore, their people turn to them and drink up waters in abundance and they say, how would God know? Does the Most High know anything? And he says, this is what the wicked are like, always carefree. They go on amassing wealth. Now he turns to his experience. Surely in vain I've kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. All day long I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments. You, you, can, you can hear the desperation in his story. Uh, a few years ago I, um, I had an invitation from a former student of mine to get together for lunch and so we met up and connected and, and he wanted to kind of update me on his life and in and, and some ways in his faith journey too. And he said he wanted to let me know that he now identified as an atheist. And so we talked about this is a kid that had been in my ministry had sat under my teaching. And, and so I, at one level, I felt, I felt honored that he wanted, he felt like he needed to be honest with me. And we were talking about it and the conversation started where a lot of these conversations started with philosophy and reason and science and evidence. And we had a kind of a back and forth and, and trying to understand each other. And I was able to push back on some of his assumptions and, and he kind of did the same with me and we went on for a while. And, but really the conversation as it evolved, it, it moved away from reason and philosophy and it, it really got into his experience. And it got to the place where he said, you know, as an, as an adult, I, I looked around me and there was people in my life and everything seemed to work for them. It was everything that they did seemed to, the end result seemed good and everything that I did seemed to end up in a disaster. Every day for me is hard, he said. And so he's like, I just can't look at the world. I can't look at the people around me and, and hold to an idea that God is fair, which that's a whole nother conversation because I would argue that we don't want God to be fair. Grace is, is not fair. But he said, I, 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 God, life isn't fair. And the conclusion that he came to was that there is no God. In fact, in, in my experience as a pastor, more often than not, when I'm in a conversation with somebody who began in a position of faith, and has now left that, has come to the conclusion that there is no God or is agnostic or whatever, and we're in these conversations, I would say nine times out of 10 that, that there is an experience that has led them to that conclusion more so than just a, a philosophy or a reason that, that took them there. And this is exactly where we find the psalmist here in Psalm 73 in the place where his expectations about how God operates, about what it means to be blessed by God don't align with his experience. Uh, his experience. It doesn't align with the people that he sees looking around and who he says completely ignore God, who completely live and act as if he doesn't exist altogether. And they're not only surviving, the psalmist says, they are thriving right? They, there's abundance and ease and comfort. And then he lays that over his own experience that, that is defined by difficulty and struggle and suffering. And it just seems to highlight the disconnect. In fact, in verse 14, he says, all day long, I've been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments, right? So the, the psalmist is essentially in this part of the story, asking himself the question, what's the point? Why do I bother? Why do I strive to live in covenant, faithful obedience to Yahweh with a result that is just affliction, pain, difficulty? 
particularly in light of the fact that the people around me who seem to ignore him altogether are, are, seem to be doing really well in life. They're, they're living the good life. They're living with ease and abundance. This question that Asaph is, is asking here, that, that's tripping him up, to use his metaphor, is not unlike Job's question. If you remember the story of Job and, and, uh, in the Old Testament, when he faces the loss of, of nearly everything and everyone he has ever loved. And, and he's sitting in this and, and he's dealing with the question, how can I reconcile this experience, this reality, with a view that says God is good? How can those two things both be true at the same time? See, the, the expectation, and, and if I'm being honest with you, I think I, I can adapt a version of this in my pragmatic theology, if you will. The expectation was that if, if you were faithful, if that you were obedient, that would result in God's blessing. And that God's blessing for you would be manifest in, in good health and prosperity and long life and things going well. Like, this is how it should go. Right? It translates into the good life. This is why when, when, again, when Job is going through his whole situation and his friends come and sit down with you, what, what is the question they ask of Job? Like, what did you do? Or what, did, what did you do that has brought on all of this? Because there's got to be some kind of unconfessed sin. There has to be some willful disobedience, some willful rejection of God in order to face this type of, of calamity. And, and Job rejects their accusations. He, he defends his innocence to his friends. In the book of Ecclesiastes, another piece of, of wisdom literature, there's, um, wisdom is personified as a teacher in, in the book of Ecclesiastes. And the teacher says this in, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He says, in this meaningless life of mine, right? So it starts in a dark place. He says, I've seen both of these. The righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. You, you, you can hear the author basically throwing up his hands in the air and saying, I don't get it. Like, I... I just don't get it. So let me ask you this morning, where in life has your expectation of God failed to meet your experience? When, when have you been forced to deal with honest doubt because you, you look around you and you see a set of circumstances or a situation and you say, how can I reconcile what is going on here with the idea that God is good and that he loves me? See, this, this psalm invites us into Asaph's experience with doubt and struggle, and it gives us permission to do the same with our own. Now, again, Asaph is writing this after the fact. This is, he is looking back on his story and his journey, and he's talking about what happened and that, and he's sharing how God worked and moved. So what has led him to the conviction that God is good? Is it the, it, did his circumstances improve? Did, did things turn around? Was there some poetic justice on the people around him that, that he describes as, as wicked, the people who just act as if they are their own God? Is that what has gone on? There's no record of that. In fact, the, what we discover here is that for Asaph, the, what happens is an encounter with God. And that Asaph's perspective is, is changed in God's presence, which leads us to this turning point. It's the turning point in this psalm, in Psalm 73. I, uh, I've mentioned this before, but um, several years ago when Sherry and I were, were pretty newly married early on, um, I had LASIK eye surgery. Um, there was this doctor in Ohio, was this, I was meeting with a friend in Glen Ellen, and he was telling me, he's like, hey, I, I, he was in full-time ministry as well. He's like, I just had LASIK eye surgery. There's this doctor in Ohio. His ministry is to provide this for free for people in full-time ministry. And it turns out this is like 15 minutes away from where my parents live. Like, incredible. And so I schedule, it was like six months wait list and all this stuff. And I go, and, 
there was three kind of steps in this journey. There was my pre-surgery, pre-fix uh, uh, perspective, right? Which was blurry and hazy and clouded. In fact, I, I always tell this story, but when they did the like pre-ops thing and they view kind of where you're at and I had my glasses on and they said that we want to we want to get kind of a baseline assessment. So take off your glasses. I took them off and they had the letters up on the on the wall. I took off my glasses and unbeknownst to me, they changed the chart. Um, so it was just the big E, you know, just one letter filled up the whole thing. And then like, well, what, what can you, what line can you read? And I thought it was still the little letters. So I'm like, I can't read those. And Sherry was in the room and she's like, it's just the big E. Like it's, <laughs> it's like everyone just knows that one. Like, he, um, but then there was, there was the surgery, right? That was the transformational moment. That was, that was the place when things changed. And then there was my perspective after the surgery. And I can still remember opening my eyes immediately after the surgery. And you're still kind of healing at this time. So it's not the clarity that I have now. But for the first time in the, and since I can remember, I looked across the room and could see the time on the clock. And it was the closest thing that I'd ever known to sort of like what it must be like to, to be healed by something. Like I, I looked and could see for the very first time, I, I had a brand new perspective. So Asaph here is describing for us when everything changes. We're back in now verse 15. He says, if I had spoken out like that, referring to his, his perspective, his, his pre-turning point perspective, I would have betrayed your children. So he's saying, if I had taught the children of Israel based on where I was at in that moment, I would have led them away from you. He's, this is kind of a confession on his point. He says, when I tried to understand all of this, it troubled me deeply. Verse 17, till I entered the sanctuary of God. Now look at the perspective shift here. He says, then I understood their final destiny, talking about the people that he previously envied. He said, surely you place them on, on slippery ground, you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakes. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. Hear him here, he says, when my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was, a, I was a brute beast before you, Asaph writes. Now, what happened that ultimately changed the psalmist's view? What changed about how he viewed the people around him that, that entirely ignored God? What changed about how he viewed himself. He says, when I tried to understand all of this, right, it troubled me deeply. And here's the turning point, until I entered the sanctuary of God. Until I entered the sanctuary of God, the turning point, the transformational moment for Asaph is when experience of, of worship it is a coming into the sanctuary of God, entering into his presence. The, the tabernacle for the Jewish people was the center of their faith, and it was the place where God made his presence known among the people. So in other words, in the psalmist experience, the presence of God recalibrates his perspective. Now, we have to think about this for a moment, because Asaph is, is from the tribe of Levi, he, he was a part of the group of people for the, the, and the Jewish tribes that were responsible to lead the people of Israel into worship. They would work in the synagogue or in the sanctuary, and they would help to, um, to perform the ordinances and to, to the sacrifices. And Asaph specifically was charged by David, chosen by David in 1 Chronicles 6, you can read this, to be one of the worship leaders for the people of Israel. Um, so it was his job to work in the temple, in the tabernacle. It was, it was his job. If we use like modern vernacular, right? He was, he was in full-time ministry and he was leading worship, right? It was, it was Eric. We're talking about Eric here, right? Like that's kind of the, the, where he was at. Like his job was to come into the presence of God and to take people there. Now it's possible that Asaph is, is writing about an experience, an encounter that happened prior to David's charge in his life and his call to, to do this. 
But I think it's also very likely that, that, that Asaph is describing a reality that in, in, even in the responsibility of leading people into worship, he had failed to come into the presence of God for himself in the midst of his honest doubts personally. Right? This, can, this can be kind of an occupational hazard for those of us who do this for a living. See, the turning point in, in either event came for Asaph when he didn't have the answers to his own questions. When, when he could no longer pretend. The turning point came in, in a place of, of brokenness and disappointment. It came in the midst of confusion and desperation. The turning point came when he was in his emptiness. When, when Asaph came to the end of his self and he enters into the sanctuary and it's when he's got nothing left, when he enters into the presence of God, that Asaph is renewed. It's when he came in the midst of his honest doubt. When, when you and I, when we come to an awareness of the truth of who God is, while simultaneously understanding our own limitations and weakness, we are changed. When, when we come into the presence of God without the answers and without an ability to say, hey, we're getting by okay, or when that, we're changed. This is Asaph's experience here similarly again when when job is he demands kind of an audience with god he wants to he wants kind of a courtroom setting and he wants to establish how he has can prove his innocence and why what has happened to him is unjust and god shows up there and if you go back and you read the book of job job does not get his courtroom moment he in fact he doesn't get any explanation of why he lost his family, why every material possession that he once owned is ruined, why his body felt like it was in decay. There's no explanation of it. There's no greater good that God says is going to happen. There's no ultimate why that Job is given. The only thing Job is given is more of God. The only thing that he receives in that moment is, is, is his presence. And Job, and then humility and honesty, says in the midst of that, he doesn't want more. He says, surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Which this leads Job, and it leads Asaph to a new reality. A new reality. This is the third thing that we see here in, in the psalm. And this is that perspective shift that we were talking about. Verse um, 22 again. He, again, he says, I was senseless and I was ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. So this is again Job's telling of, of his process here. He says, yet I was always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Those who are far from you will perish. You will destroy all who are unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I've made the sovereign Lord my refuge, and I will tell all of your deeds. So you can, you can hear the perspective shift here. You can hear Asaph say, look at these people that I envied, that I look at who are far from you, but their life seems to be going well. This is the proverbial sort of like train that's heading towards a bridge and you don't know the bridge is out and everybody in there is having a great time and celebrating and they don't know what is in front of them. Asaph sees this now. He, he, does no, he no longer envies there. He, he's almost grieving their condition apart from God. And then his own perspective on himself begins to shift. And here's, this is so important. He's beginning to recognize and realize that present realities aren't ultimate realities. Present realities aren't ultimate realities. This perspective shift as he looked at, as it relates to what he defines as, as the wicked and his awareness of of what is happening in their life. And now he begins to see and discover for himself that the circumstances around him don't define his ultimate reality. Because his ultimate reality was, was clarified in the presence of God. 
In fact, there's a couple things here. If you look real quickly in verse 23, he, he, he gets to this point. He says, you, you hold me by my right hand that in all situations, in every circumstance, Asaph says, I, I, this is where my comfort, this is where my confidence comes from, is that no matter what's going on around me, God is with me. That, that he is the one who sustains me. In verse 24, he says, you guide me with your counsel. Right? He, he isn't left to just wander aimlessly. This path that he describes about being on, this path has a direction and a destination. And he says, even in the midst of that, there is one who guides me on the path. And then at the back half of verse 24, he says, and you take me into glory. You take me into glory. And here is Asaph's conclusion. This is, this is his ultimate reality that shapes him and, and, and how he views and understands his present reality is that there is a day and age when I will go and be with you. He describes this ultimate reality. Whom do I have in heaven but you? This is when Jesus taught his disciples. He said it this way. He said, seek first my kingdom, right? Seek, seek my kingdom. Set your eyes there. And then all these other things, though, this will be added to you, but seek my kingdom is how Jesus describes it to us. See, the, the psalmist comes to the realization that what he has in the presence of God, that there's nothing that the world could offer him that he would exchange that for. In verse 25, he says, what does the world have to give me that would be better than what I've already got in him? I was thinking this week about, about moments when I've seen this, people who lived this out. Um, about eight years ago, um, I conducted a, a funeral for one of my high school kids. Um, she was a student at, at um, St. Charles East High School. In her sophomore year of high school, she was diagnosed with leukemia. And, um, and by about the spring of her junior year, she, she passed away. Um, her name is Anna Daly, and, and I would um, check in frequently with the family and call to pray with them and her and they would update me on how she's doing and there was moments of great hope and we thought there might be healing coming and then moments of just sheer terror when you realize how this story was going to end. Um, Anna Daly, um, one of her legacies by the way, is that she created a scholarship fund and um, that people gave to uh, where every time a middle school or high school student says, hey, I'd, I'd love to go on this retreat. I'd love to go on this mission trip. I'd love to be a part of this event, but my family just can't afford it right now. Um, our, our student ministry team can say, yeah, we, we want you here um, because Anna Daly created a way. It's, it's part of her legacy here at, at Chapel Street. But one of the things that Anna did, her, her parents gave me this gift um, following her service. It's, she was on the golf team at, um, at St. Charles East High School. And um, this sits on my shelf in my office, and it reminds me of the legacy of her faith. Um, because Anna would keep this Caring Bridge website where she would kind of update people on how things were going and, and her treatments and how people could be praying. And she, she posted her last um, blog entry when she knew she was just days away from, from passing away. And she just kind of accounted um, her confidence in who God is. Her, her faith is an, is an amazing example. And I remember thinking, like, how does a 17-year-old come to this conclusion? And the thing that struck me is the last three words that she ever wrote on that blog were the very same three words that started this psalm. God is good. God is good. And how does a 17-year-old guide us into the realization that God is good when she's experiencing something that every single one of us would look at and say, that's, that's unjust, that's unfair, this should not be the way this story goes. And I'll tell you how. It's because that Anna Daly had an encounter with the presence of God that transformed her life to the point that she says, what I have in him, there's nothing this world would ever offer me that I would trade it for. She held that conviction so deeply and so profoundly that when she was facing the most difficult time in her life, she could write the words, God is good. And so this morning as we conclude, I wanna invite us into the presence of God. 
Um, one of the ways that we experience that in our community is when we come to the Lord's table. Um, Jesus and his grace and mercy knew that we would, we would need to come back time and time again into his presence. And I want to encourage you this morning, come in your struggle. Come in the honesty of your questions. Come in whatever doubt you may be wrestling with. Maybe that's not where you're at right now. That's okay. But, but don't be afraid to come into his presence with nothing to offer. And he'll meet us at the table. In just a moment, our ushers will come and I'll pass the plates and, and we can grab both of the cups and just hold on to those for a moment, if you will. And then I will return shortly to, to guide us in the taking of the bread and the cup. If you're new with us here, please don't, um, this, is, this is not a Chapel Street Church thing. You don't have to be a member of this church. If you, if you are in a relationship with Jesus, um, you are welcome to come and take the cup. If you're still wrestling with that, you're still thinking about what is this whole faith thing about? What, is, what does it mean to be in a relationship with Jesus? That's okay too. Allow, let the plate pass you by. Just allow this to be something that you experience and to be kind of a picture of what we believe about Jesus. I'm going to pray for us, and then our worship team will lead us, and then I'll return to guide us in the taking of the cup. Um, would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this day, and we thank you for this time to look at a, a, um, a very honest story, a story that sometimes we're uncomfortable with, a, a story that sometimes we're um, taken aback by that we don't know how to deal with, but we thank you that Asaph was willing to share his honest doubt and his struggle and that you met him there as you do us. So this morning, Lord, we pray that you would lead us into your presence, that we would come vulnerable, nothing to bring, even in the midst of our doubts and struggles and our anxiety and our questions, Lord, we come into your presence today. Meet us at your table and it's in your name we pray. Amen.